Um, If you have your uh, Bibles, let's turn to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to be in chapter 3 this morning, uh, King Jesus uh, series, uh, Matthew uh, 3 today. So we're doing one chapter uh, a Sunday, and so today is Matthew 3. So next Sunday will be Matthew 4, and so this next week we want to encourage you to be reading Matthew 4 in preparation for coming to be with us uh, next Sunday. So Matthew 3 today, I'm going to do this. Uh, The chapter is uh, kind of broken up in a couple of different parts. Uh, And the first uh, section is we're just going to make some observations about John the Baptist. So uh, chapter 3 is really about the ministry of John the Baptist and about the baptism of Jesus. And so uh, kind of a two-part, two main sections of uh, the chapter. And so uh, I like to call John the Baptist JTB or J the B. So just roll with me. So that's who I mean. I might call him John, but we want to distinct uh, John the Baptist from the Apostle John. And so let's just roll with J the B. Are you guys with me on this? So we'll make some observations about uh, J the B. And then at the end, we'll make some observations that I think are really significant for us around the baptism of Christ. Um, So in some observations, point one of the morning, uh, if we could pull that first slide, I'm gonna make three three observations to begin with. Just context, let's get some context. Many of you know some of the things that I'll be mentioning right now will be things that you have already learned if you've been around the church and if you've learned, if you've been through Matthew or or any of the gospels really. And so some of these things you know, but I think it's important to get some context um, in making these observations. The first thing, uh, his birth. The birth of John the Baptist was miraculous, a miraculous birth. And um, it really mirrors, if you think of the Old Testament story of Abraham and Sarah and their miracle baby, Bible trivia, Abraham, Sarah, their baby, miracle baby, Isaac, there we go, Isaac. Uh, And they were laughing because, anybody know how old Abraham was when Isaac was born? A hundo. A hundo, that's a pretty old dude. So miraculous, right, story of Abraham and Sarah, their miracle baby, Isaac. Um, Also, John the Baptist, his parents, elderly parents who had never also been able to have children. Uh, Do you know John the Baptist? Bible trivia. This is fun. This is fun. Bible trivia. John the Baptist's parents were, his dad is? Zechariah and his mother is? Elizabeth, right? Uh, And so we see this in Luke chapter one, Zechariah was incredulous that he was going to be a a father. Uh, The angel Gabriel comes uh, to him and he says, speaking of John, and the angel Gabriel said, he, John the Baptist, will be great in the sight of the Lord and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before the Lord, a herald before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah. We'll talk about that in just a second, the connection between John the Baptist and Elijah. Uh, He will uh, go in the spirit and the power of Elijah to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Um, Contextually, when you read about John the Baptist in the gospels, many people in Israel were wondering and thinking, could this be the one? Could John the Baptist actually be the long awaited Messiah? Um, So one, his birth was miraculous. Secondly, his relation to Jesus, they were first cousins. They were cousins. They weren't first cousins. They were cousins. Um, John was related in this way that their mothers, Mary and Elizabeth, were cousins. And so they were related in that way. Uh, Gabriel told Mary that she would give birth to Jesus. And also in that same interaction, also in Luke chapter one, she told Mary that Elizabeth uh, would be pregnant with with John as well. And so when Mary, you know the story, when Mary was carrying Jesus in her womb and she went to visit her cousin Elizabeth, John the Baptist leapt in the womb of his mother in the very presence of Jesus in the womb of Mary. So John the Baptist, the herald of Jesus, uh, also a cousin of the Lord. Uh, His adult ministry, this is the connection to Elijah. Uh, We want to connect John the Baptist to the prophets of old. 
We think of the prophets of the Old Testament. Uh, John the Baptist was a prophet like those of old. The, co the context and the significance of John the Baptist is that um, God had been silent. With, there, there, there had not been a prophetic voice of God for over 400 years. And we know that context between Micah, the last book of the Old Testament, and the Gospels. There had not been a prophet of God for 400 years. And so God's silence, God's prophetic silence ended with John the Baptist. And so the emergence of John the Baptist was like a loud shout of God, a voice of God to God's people after many, many, many years of silence. Um, John the Baptist proclaimed the coming of the Messiah to people who desperately needed a savior. 700 years previously, we've been talking about the book of, of Matthew uh, written to Jewish people. Matthew was a Jew and he wrote the gospel of Matthew to Jewish people to convince the Jewish people that Jesus was Messiah. And so fulfillment is on every page in the gospel of Matthew. Every page in the gospel, you will find the word fulfillment or almost on every page of the book of Matthew. Also, John the Baptist, fulfillment of prophecy 700 years earlier, uh, Isaiah chapter 40, the voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Matthew will quote that uh, prophecy in Matthew 3. You will read that in just a minute. We know that uh, John the Baptist lived this uh, rugged life in the mountainous area of Judea. Do we have a, do we have a map uh, on, your, on your slides? Okay. Um, he lived in a rugged mountainous region of Judea between the city of Jerusalem and the Dead Sea. And so there's this area in Israel, and I got to be there two years ago, which is so fun to read the Gospels when you've seen it with your own eyes, uh, from Jerusalem south uh, down into the Jordan River area and then down even further south in the Dead Sea. That mountainous area is where John the Baptist uh, was uh, ministering to people. And we'll read this again in Matthew 3 in just a moment. He was wearing uh, camel hair, like his clothing was made of camel hair. Uh, his diet was honey and locusts. Sounds yummy. Sounds real yummy, right? Honey and locusts and um, wearing camel hair. Well, the significance of that, the reason why that's in there, it's an exact, it's an exact reference to Elijah. The reference to Elijah, who also had a garment of hair and a belt of leather, just like John the Baptist. Um, here's a side note on Elijah. The greatest of the prophets was Elijah. And John the Baptist was a fulfillment and connected to Elijah. When Jesus' glory was made visible, we'll get here in Matthew 17. When Jesus' glory was made visible, there were two men who were standing beside him uh, in, in the transfiguration of Christ. Bible trivia, anybody know who it is? It was who? Elijah and Moses. Elijah and Moses. So Moses represented the law, the old covenant law in that, in that um, um, context in Matthew 12, when Jesus was transformed before them and Elijah represented the prophets. And so the prophets, if we connect Elijah and John the Baptist, uh, we think about um, how, um, what's that? Oh, you have the map. Oh, sweet. So, I mean, we've, we're already past this, but you can see Judea. So just, just the context, Galilee, their regions, those are regions of Israel. Um, think of it like states, I guess you could say. So Galilee, the northern region, Samaria in the middle, Judea, and wh where Jericho and Jerusalem is. And so you can see south of Jerusalem, uh, down the Dead Sea, the Jordan River is the connect between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. So there we are. I'm going to bring that map up in just a second again. Um, but we think about Elijah, we think about John the Baptist, they were so saturated with the presence of God, they were fearless before men who opposed them. Think of uh, in Acts um, that the religious leaders were so enamored with the disciples, I think it's in Acts chapter 4, that it was obvious that these were ordinary men that had been with, with Christ. They, they, um, Elijah, John the Baptist, so saturated in the very presence of God that it made them fearless before men who oppose him. Elijah denounced Ahab and Jezebel. And John the Baptist was unafraid of Herod, 
who was um, the Roman uh, king of the Jews. We talked about Herod a couple of weeks ago. So there's some initial context. We'll make another uh, point about John the Baptist in just a minute. But let's get into the text. If you have your Bibles, let's look at Matthew chapter 3. And I don't think I have my glasses. We'll see how this goes. I don't have my readers today. We'll see how this goes. Here we go. Uh, Matthew 3, 1 to 6. Let me read this with you. In those days, uh, John the Baptist, he came and he was preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, and this was his, this was his message, repent. We know that repent means change your mind. Repent, change your mind for the reason why I want you to change your mind for the kingdom of heaven is near. Do you know what Jesus said in Luke 4 when he, when he began to proclaim the gospel in his public ministry? He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Same message as John the Baptist. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who has spoken of things through the prophet Isaiah. This is from Isaiah 40, 700 years before. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Ooh. Where'd you get those? Oh my gosh. It's amazing. I'm doing okay right now, but now I don't know where I am. Oh, uh, verse four. John's clothes, here it is, direct reference to Elijah. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. People went out to him. People went to John the Baptist from Jerusalem. And all Judea, that whole region from the city of Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan River. And they were confessing their sins and they were baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. John, the herald of the king, preparing other people's hearts who were humble enough to repent. Preparing the way for Jesus for people, and this is really significant, who are humble enough to acknowledge their own need of a savior. Uh, in that day, in that context, in that time, a king coming, any king coming to your city, to your area, was always announced by herald, do, 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 do. I mean, it was, there was always an announcement. There was always a herald coming before the king, letting everyone know the king is coming. A message was sent to prepare people for the coming of the king. Uh, the, the Messiah was announced by his special herald, John the Baptist. His work was to prepare Israel, the Jewish people, for the coming king of kings. Again, his message was simple and it was direct. Repent, change, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So his message was that repent for the kingdom of heaven is near and his ministry, his ministry was baptism. Admit, confess, come in agreement uh, that you have sin in your life and you need a savior, you need atonement, you need to be rescued. And the humble, again, the humble acknowledge the need for grace and the self-righteous resist it. The humble recognize their need of a savior and the self-righteous resist it. So there's a reality in his ministry of two different camps of people that were responding to the ministry, to the herald of John the Baptist. Among people who were humble, among people who were hungry for salvation and for rescue and redemption, there were many people from Jerusalem, all Judea and the entire region that were coming confessing their sins and being baptized in John the Baptist's baptism of repentance. But his ministry was very opposed by the Jewish leadership, which I think is a really key point to understand in the story because the self-righteous Pharisees and Sadducees, the Jewish leaders of the day, they stayed out of the water. They stayed away. In fact, they stayed out of the water and in judgment of John the Baptist and his ministry. And to the self-righteous, to the religious leaders who did not acknowledge their need of a savior, John the Baptist, his words were quite stern. So 
Let's continue to read verses 7 to 12. And I will use these, John Michael, so thank you for that. It's like a game changer for this old guy. Okay, 7 to 12. But when, but when John the Baptist, when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, this is what John the Baptist said to them. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath of God or the coming justice of God? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. He is going to People understand that his baptism is different than the baptism of Christ. I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me will come the one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And his winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Pretty stern words, wouldn't you say, for the self-righteous religious leaders in the room. I can tell you, I've been a pastor for 20 years. I've never, I mean, I've been ruffled by religious people before, but I've never called someone a brood of vipers before. John the Baptist is not mincing his words in the context. A brood of vipers, you are snakes. You religious leaders, you are snakes. And you, you self-righteous people, you need to be warned of the coming wrath of God. He uses this, um, this picture, this word picture of threshing, which is a very um, understood context in an agricultural culture, threshing and winnowing, a winnowing fork by hand, common, very common in ancient times, allowing for this very vivid biblical imagery, separating worthless chaff from the valuable grain uh, that was a ready symbol, the, the symbol, that, that visual separating chaff from the valuable grain using a winnowing fork is the separation of good from evil. I think in this context for John the Baptist, it's the separation from the humble who are ready to repent and receive Messiah as Savior and those who are self-righteous saying, I do not need to repent. People of the day, um, they just simply didn't address leaders like John the Baptist, uh, religious or otherwise, uh, in this manner. And the reason why they wouldn't address leaders like this is for fear of punishment. Like there's the, 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 the boldness of John the Baptist and his very presence of who Jesus is and what he was called to do to herald Jesus and prepare people for salvation, his his boldness is remarkable for us to see and understand. His faith made him fearless again, uh, just like Elijah in the face of opposition. Here's a visual. Here's a visual. And um, this is something that I hadn't thought about until the last couple of weeks in preparing for this. Uh, so here, here's a visual. Uh, visualize uh, John, his ministry, John the Baptist, as a representation of the old covenant law. He, he is a manifestation of the old covenant law preparing the way for Jesus. He as is, he as, is if, John the Baptist, the ministry, of, as if the law, the old covenant law had come to life. And it's this context, ruthlessly, and that's what the law does, ruthlessly confronting people with their sin and their need for a savior which is what the law does. That's what the law does. And then, and then what he does is he calls them again to humbly 
repent. And he is heralding the Savior. I want to remind you of the purpose of the law. We studied this in Galatians chapter 3. If we could bring that next slide up. I just want to remind you of some things we learned in our Galatians series. As we consider thinking about John the Baptist kind of being a, a personal manifestation of the old covenant law, confronting people with their sin and their need to confess their sin and repent and call on Messiah. Here's what Paul tells us in Galatians 3. Verse 19, why then was the law given at all? What's the, what's the purpose of the Mosaic law to begin with? It was added because of transgressions until the seed, and the seed is Jesus. It was added until Jesus, to whom the promised referenced, referred had come. Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The promise referred is to the seed of Abraham. Jesus is fulfilling the promise to Abraham that his descendants would be all nations and would outnumber the numbers of the stars in the heavens. And then verse 24, the law has become our guardian. This is so important to understand. The law has become our guardian to do what? To lead us to Christ. The purpose of the old covenant law is to lead people to Jesus. What is the ministry of John the Baptist? To lead people to Jesus so that they would humbly acknowledge their need for a Savior so that we may be justified by faith. Amen. There is no gospel. There is no good news of the gospel without an understanding of our need for it based on the law. And John, manifestation of the law, leading people to Jesus and his grace. And uh, we, we sang this song. We had a men's retreat this past weekend. Uh, a number of us here this morning from that retreat. And we, uh, Spada led us in amazing grace last night. We sang some hymns. It was awesome. But I would say this. You can't get, you can't get, I can't get, we can't get to amazing grace if we don't understand our need for it. We we don't celebrate the amazing reality of grace, the unmerited favor of God to us if we don't first understand our need for it. Repent, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You have a savior. It's a ministry of John the Baptist. One more observation on John and then we'll look at his baptism. One of the things for me that jumps off the page around John the Baptist, we can bring that next slide up, is his humility the humility of John the Baptist is worth following. The way to follow is the way of humility. And I've never connected this before. And so that's what I love about going through a book together is connecting the humility of Joseph. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago and connecting that with John. Their, their humility, it's like I'm studying, I'm reading. I'm like, Lord, work more humility in me like Joseph and like John the Baptist, to trust, to simply trust God and to obey God, even when it's hard, even when there's unknown, even when there's fear involved, that, that I have such a, a keenly aware sense of the presence of God and the trust in God that there will just be this humble obedience before the Lord. We saw it in the passage, uh, John the Baptist, after me comes the one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. So many people, I mean, talk about like culture today and celebrity pastors, good, goodness, goodness gracious, alive. Celebrity pastors, right? Um, you guys, John the Baptist was a celebrity prophet. Everybody was coming. To, many people thought he was the Messiah. Like, to think of a moment, like, I man, can you imagine how like your pride, my pride could get in the way? They'd be like, I'm the man. You know what? They're coming to me. I'll just take this thing and run. And his humility is so remarkable. I'm not even to carry the sandals of my cousin to whom I proclaim to you is the Lord and King. It's just, it's so worthy to follow. 
the humility of John the Baptist. In John 3, uh, he makes this famous statement um, that he, Jesus, Jesus must increase and I must decrease. The humility of John, the way of humility. Um, we know this passage in the New Testament uh, that God resists the proud, but he gives his grace to the, tell me, humble, humble, repent, change, humble yourself, acknowledge your need for a savior. And I'm here to proclaim to you that the savior has come and his name is Jesus. Have you ever considered once Jesus' public ministry begins, which is, gonna, is our next passage, his, his baptism was the beginning of his public ministry. What do we know about John the Baptist after Jesus' public ministry began? It goes away. It goes away. What we know of John the Baptist is in the first two, two, three chapters of the gospel. And then he goes away because he was martyred for his faith by Herod. Once Jesus appears on the scene, the ministry of John the Baptist was fulfilled. The herald of the king had come. And so Jesus' ministry begins, his public ministry begins, and John the Baptist gets to be a part of it. Can you imagine baptizing the Lord of the universe? and how much humility that would have required to baptize the King of Kings and the Lord of Lord, um, Lord of Lords. So let's, let's read this passage, um, observations about Jesus's baptism, uh, Matthew 3, 13 to 17. So Jesus came from Galilee. Can we pull that map back up again? Is that possible to pull up real quick? Jesus came from where? Galilee. You see Nazareth up there by the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, which is where um, a lot of his ministry. He came down from Galilee through Samaria all the way to Jericho into the area of the Jordan River where, where John the Baptist was ministering. And so he makes that transition. He came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him. He was resistant. He was resisting his cousin coming and saying, I'm here to be baptized by you. The humility, but John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? And Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. That verse is really, really important. And we're gonna unpack that. So uh, put a box around that in your Bible, uh, underline that. That's a really important verse that we wanna understand this morning. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven, Abba, Father, a voice from heaven said, this is my son with whom, whom I love and with him I am well pleased. Jesus comes from the north where he grew up, Nazareth area, the, the, the region of Galilee to be baptized by his cousin. Um, it's one of only, the baptism of Jesus is, only, is one, of, of one of only three stories that's included in all the gospels. So Bible trivia, baptism is one. Does anybody know what the other two? There's only three stories of the life of Christ that's in every gospel, which I go, that's probably pretty significant. We should, we should consider doing a deep dive to the three stories. Wouldn't you agree that's included in every single gospel? The baptism of Jesus is one. Anybody want to take a stab at the other two? Say again. The last, supper. last Supper, good guess, no. <laughs> Feeding of 5,000. The feeding of the 5,000, and the other is pretty obvious, the crucifixion. I mean, I, did, I never grabbed onto that till this week. Wow, that's interesting, isn't it? The baptism of Christ, the feeding of the 5,000, and his crucifixion. And we're going to make a connection today between the baptism of Christ and his crucifixion and how he identifies with sinners. The beginning of his ministry, identifying with sinners, and his cross, identifying with sinners. Um, 
So three, three quick things uh, on the ministry or on the, on the baptism of Christ. Uh, if we can pull that next slide up. Uh, one, first thing, it marks the change from the private life of Jesus to his public ministry. So now Jesus as Messiah is on the public scene. This is a public reality. And so Jesus' baptism uh, marks the change from private life to his public ministry. Uh, secondly, it shows that God calls out our identity in him first, which empowers us in ministry. Why do I say that? Because Jesus's ministry hadn't begun yet. Jesus hadn't done anything in public ministry up to this point other than come from Galilee and have his cousin baptize him. And what does the father say after Jesus is baptized? He goes, hey, everybody, this is my son right here. Everybody look at my son and I love my son. And with him, I am well pleased. What had, what had he done in public ministry up to that point? Huh? Water to wine was the first miracle. What, what, what I'm inviting you to consider is with him, I am well pleased that our identity in Christ, our being in Christ, the proclamation of who we are in Christ is true. It's given to us and that is disconnected from what we do for God. Are you all with me right now? And so we are declared, we have a being that's being declared to us, a truth of God to receive. And our being in Christ, our identity in Christ is what empowers us to do, to go and to fulfill the mission that God has given us. And we see it in Jesus himself, that God calls out our identity in him first and that empowers us in ministry second. And then thirdly, it shows that Jesus came to identify himself with sinners to save them. John knew he was certainly not worthy to baptize his own savior. And he rightly recognizes that the sinless son of God needed no baptism of repentance. You ever consider this before? Like John the Baptist, his ministry was a baptism of repentance, which is confess your sins. Did Jesus need to repent of anything? Did Jesus need to confess? No, he's the sinless son of God. So have you ever even considered to pause and be like, what? why did Jesus even get baptized? What's the point of Jesus being baptized? And John is resisting it. He's resisting it. And this is what Jesus says again, uh, verse 15. He says, let this be so now for it is fitting. This occurs, it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. What does he mean by that? We're gonna do this. We're gonna do this together for righteousness sake. And this is what's so important to grab onto. Here's the new covenant truth of Jesus. Here's the new covenant reality of Jesus coming in, the new covenant of grace. A person is righteous, not by the law, not by following the law, but by faith. The new covenant proclamation is that we are righteous in Christ. We have right standing with God because of our faith. Righteousness or right standing before God means that we are being what God requires us to be. Here's the reality. We can't follow the law. The law leads us. The purpose of the law is what? To lead us to Christ who fulfills the law for us and we have faith in Christ, it fulfills righteous, why? Because we are righteous in Christ, not by our doing, but by his perfect obedience. No one can be righteous before God by their own doing. We are righteous because of Jesus. Let me read um, a quick verse, uh, Romans chapter three. A uh, seminary professor uh, said this, we were studying this in seminary. He goes, this is the most important paragraph in the entire Bible. His perspective, his perspective. Uh, but I've always remembered that, like this passage, because it is about being righteous by faith. So I want you to connect what I'm about to read in Romans 3 to what Jesus says at his baptism. This must occur to fulfill all righteousness. Here's what Paul says. Uh, Romans 3, 19 uh, down to 22. Uh, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. 
Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus to all who believe. To all who believe. That's the New Testament truth. So how is it, how is it that Jesus is fulfilling all righteousness by being baptized? Again, he's not repenting. He's, he, there's no confession of sin for Jesus. It's fulfilling all righteousness because he is identifying himself with sinners who need to repent. It's an identification with sinners. His baptism, in his baptism, he was identifying himself with sinners at the baptism who needed to repent. And then we, we, we move from the beginning of Jesus's ministry at his baptism to the other story that is included in every gospel, which is his crucifixion, where again, he identifies himself with sinners who needed to be atoned. And so the ministry of Jesus from the beginning of his ministry to the end of his earthly ministry is identifying himself with sinners. Why? Because he came to save you and he came to save me. So what does Jesus mean when he says it is fitting for us to fulfill our righteousness? He is saying it is good and right in God's eyes for Jesus to be identified with sinners. That's why 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Paul says this, God made him, God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us, to be baptized, to go to the cross in our place. God, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in Christ we might become, here's the word, the righteousness of God. This is to fulfill all righteousness, John. I'm identifying with sinners, baptize me. In humility, in humility, John obeys and he consents to baptize Jesus and he comes out of the water and it says that heaven was opened. In this moment, heaven was opened and the spirit of, the, of God descended on Jesus like a dove and lighting on him. Um, that, that scene, that, there is so much commentary about this. What, what was happening in the cosmos when Jesus was back and the heavens open and this dove comes down. I mean, I, there's so much to read on it, you guys. I'm not gonna get into the weeds. It's already 9.37. I don't have time to get into the weeds with you on it. But what I do want to do is point this out. A dove came down and lighted on Jesus. What is, what is a dove a symbol of? Peace. A dove is a symbol of peace. What famous Old Testament story, famous Old Testament story also has a dove, a part of the story? N Noah, right, exactly, so Noah. So let's, let's, let's think about Noah's dove for a second. God was judging the evil on the earth with what? There was, a, there was evil on the earth and God was just, he was gonna reset it, he's resetting it with Noah and the ark. And he used what? to judge the earth, water, a flood. So he uses water to judge it. So water, water is the symbol of God judging evil. And once God's judgment had subsided, uh, Noah releases a dove and he comes back, the dove comes back holding what in its mouth? An olive branch, okay? Hold on to the olive branch. And then, and then the dove was released again a second time. And if you know the story, the dove, the dove never came back. The dove was free. Okay, hold on to this. It meant, it meant that the judgment of the water was over. That's, that's what that, that connection is. So let's connect Noah's dove with the baptism dove. John, again, manifestation of the law, ruthlessly calling out people's sins so that they would repent and call on Jesus as Savior. Baptizes Jesus, who is the manifestation of the new covenant of grace. 
and to mark this transition between the ending of the old covenant of law and the beginning of the new covenant of grace, a dove, peace, symbol of peace, comes down and lights on Jesus. The judgment of Noah's dove was water. The judgment of God based on the law was coming to an end. Are y'all connecting this? The judgment of God based on the law that none of us, none of us can achieve was coming to an end in Jesus. He, he is the fulfillment of the law for us, identifying with us. And so the new way of God's grace in Jesus was here. Now connect a dove in another way. Garden of Gethsemane, night before the cross, Jesus identifies himself with sinners at the baptism. He identifies himself with sinners at the cross. Thursday night, I grew up Methodist, Maundy Thursday. I can't get into that. I don't have time to get into that. In the Garden of Gethsemane, do you know what the garden was filled with? What kind of trees? Olive trees. Olive trees. In Jesus, we have shalom. In Christ, we have peace. Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2, he himself, Jesus himself is our peace. God's judgment through the law was over for those who repent, confess their need of a savior, believe upon the name of Jesus, the free gift of salvation in Jesus. And those whom the son sets free are free indeed. And this, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And if Christ has set you free, you are free indeed. Therefore, don't submit again to another yoke of slavery, old covenant law. Isn't this amazing to connect the dots between these two realities? John, the, his baptism uh, context was different than new covenant baptism. It's different. John's, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Jesus's baptism was of the Holy Spirit and of fire. Totally different. John the Baptist promised the Holy Spirit. He said, he, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And so instead of having an outward law on us that we can't achieve anyway, the purpose of the law is to lead us to Christ. Instead of having an outward law, God has moved inward into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. God has promised his spirit to put his spirit to those who believe. Ephesians chapter one, when we believe in Christ, we are sealed in the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter two, the spirit that rose Jesus from the dead lives in us. We have the very spirit of the living God in us. And this, this is grace. This is grace that we live by the spirit. Uh, Jesus, the King has come to earth to set up his spiritual kingdom. Repent, change your mind, believe, Receive Jesus as Messiah. I proclaim to you the Savior of the world this morning. His name is Jesus, and He is the Savior. Jesus, Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners who humble themselves and a ransom from heaven, Jesus, Messiah, Lord of all, amen? Lord, thank you for John the Baptist, this passage of scripture, this story. Awaken us, Lord, that you have identified yourself with us to save us. We glory in the name of Jesus and in the ministry of Jesus and in the work of Jesus, we declare, we declare,
that you are the Lord of all. And so Lord, thank you for the privilege it is again to gather in your name as a church family in this space to be, to be under the teaching of your word, Lord, that it would be light to our feet and a lamp to our path, Lord, that we would be hungry for the word of God and we would be equipped and encouraged and strengthened today in your word. And Lord, that we would be thirsty for your Holy Spirit that is in us, reminding us, convincing us, convicting us that we are children of God and that you are pleased with us because Jesus, your spirit is in us. Hallelujah. We bless your name. And Lord, we wanna worship in response. We wanna celebrate with joy in response. We wanna sing and be filled with your spirit as we respond to this truth this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.